Okay, so last lesson in Science 10. Okay, okay what we're going to be going over today, guys, are biomes. Okay, what a biome is, is essentially an ecological region where you can find certain plants and animals and, and uh, environmental conditions. Okay, so there are some unique areas on Earth that show things that are different from other areas. We call them biomes. We're going to go over the major ones. Okay, it doesn't mean that that's necessarily all of them, but there are the major ones okay, that we are going to go over. What you will be expected to do with this stuff is essentially two things. If I show you a climatogram on the unit exam, and I will, you have to be able to tell me what biome it comes from and explain why. Okay, so expect that that is certainly going to be on your unit exam. I show you a biome, you tell me, or sorry, a, a climatogram, and you tell me which biome of these it matches with. That's usually pretty straightforward. Okay, and the one that's even more straightforward than that is, in a multiple choice question, I give you both a picture and a description of a biome, and you have to tell me which one it is. Okay, that's what you'll be expected to do with this stuff. Is that pretty clear? All right, so things to make note of, okay, in, in, in here would be, what is it? that this um, you know biomes climatogram going to look like you know if it's something that's very tropical it's going to have a line for temperature okay who knows what'll happen with the precipitation but the temperature won't fluctuate very much okay um, if we're looking at something that's very far from the equator it's obviously going to have a big curve in its uh, climatogram and uh, you know again depending on the area the temp the precipitation may do you know maybe very dry or maybe concentrated all at one time okay things like that so those are the kind of things to look for and maybe write down in the margins okay as we're going through this there should be a fair amount of highlighting and little you know kind of jot note taking as we go through this cuz I'll expand on kind of what's on the uh, on the notes here all right so that kind of covers that Okay, so the major biomes of the world are identified on this map. Okay, uh, our first major biome that we'll talk about is the tropical rainforest. Okay, and the tropical rainforest is all of these green areas. So, you see, obviously, the biggest rainforest in the world, the Amazon. Okay, they're in South America, so that's, you know, Colombia and uh, Brazil and Ecuador and pl places like that. Okay, uh, that are in there, uh, Venezuela, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've got a little bit here in Central America, right, uh, over here, like Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, okay, Southern Mexico, stuff like that. Um, we also have a lot of tropical rainforest over here in Southeast Asia. Those would be places like uh, Papua New Guinea, um, uh, Vietnam, Laos, okay, um, Thailand, places like that. Okay, they're going to be very, uh, very tropical. And there's a few here and there in Africa where moisture happens to come in and, and give you know fairly steady rainfall and things like that. Um, but those are essentially the only places you're going to find it. Where is it all located? In general near the equator okay it you don't see any tropical rainforest outside of 30 degrees from the equator right because beyond 30 degrees it's temperate now no longer tropical seasonality starts to kick in there's definite summer and winter okay so you just don't see it okay uh, another one that we're going to talk about is the savanna okay this is where you would see like uh, lions and tigers but no bears Okay, um, wildebeests and water buffalo and giraffes and stuff like that. Okay, it's kind of that open uh, area that you see in Africa, like if the safari kind of that kind of place. Okay, long, tall grasses and you know sparse trees here and there, things like that. Okay, so you you mainly see this the, the uh, savanna here in Africa. Okay, there is a little bit here in sen in South America. A lot of that is artificial. Okay, and I don't mean that they built it. I mean that they they hacked down the rainforest, and as a result, it didn't all grow back. So you get a tropical grassland kind of taking over. Um, there is a little bit of savanna-like areas in in the in Australia, not kind of true savanna, but it's dry and tropical grassland kind of thing. Okay, again, you don't see savanna, or at least you don't see very much of it outside of 30 degrees north or south of the equator. All right, desert. There's different kinds of deserts, okay? There's hot deserts, okay? And obviously, you know, the Sahara here would be a hot desert, right? And basically, all of the Middle East right, is a hot desert. Um, 
I mean, that's the kind of shifting sands that you see in uh, places like Tunisia, which uh, if you've ever watched Star Wars, that's where they film Tatooine, okay? The, the planet Tatooine is always filmed, okay, in Tunisia, because that's where they just have nothing but dunes and rolling sand, okay? Things like that. Uh, there's also the rockier hot deserts, okay, um, that you would see in that area as well, okay? But we also see desert up here, okay? And this would be a colder desert. That's the Gobi Desert, right? It's in the rain shadow of the Himalaya Mountains. Um, there's some that are kind of on the uh, edges of, of inland seas where there's a lot of salt and things like that. So we get a desert kind of in that area. Okay? Obviously, uh, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, okay? and much of western Mexico would also be considered to be desert. That would be a rocky desert as opposed to a sandy desert. Okay? And parts of uh, Arizona and Utah do get snow. Okay? So they can be colder deserts as well. Okay, there's extreme deserts. That's the kind of whitish blue color. And where do you see that mostly? Yeah, Greenland. Okay. Where else? Little strips of it here and there. What's this? Yeah, it's the Rockies. Okay, it's the Rocky Mountains. So you see extreme desert on the tops of mountain ranges because what's there? Rock and ice. It doesn't get warm enough for that to really get uh, you know, sufficient growing time for any plants of any kind of stature. Okay, so typically we just see rocks and ice. This would be like your glaciers and ice fields and, and things like that. Now, there is one place that's not on this map that should be entirely that color. Well, Iceland's on this map. It's right there. It's a big continent. Well, it's not a big, big continent. Antarctica. Yeah, it's just not on this map for whatever reason, but it should entirely be that color. All right? It's entirely covered with uh, rock and ice. Okay, uh, chaparral. This is oftentimes called the Mediterranean climate, okay, or a sclerophyllous forest. Okay, and the reason it's, it's called uh, Mediterranean climate is, well, it kind of tends to be concentrated there. Right, so if you've ever been to Greece or Italy, okay, or places like that, okay, you've been in that climate. In the summertime, it's hot, okay, it's hot and it's dry, right, um, and so you have a very kind of different set of plants and animals uh, that live in that area. You do see little uh, bits and pieces of it, like kind of Southern California is kind of considered to be a little bit that way, and there's a little bit of it here on the southern uh, tip of Australia, okay, but mostly it tends to be around the Mediterranean. Temperate grasslands, typically we call those prairie, okay, that's where we live, right, so we see a lot of prairie here in the central part of North America, um, and quite a bit of Central Asia is also going to be, um, is going to be prairie, they call it steppe there, okay, um, but, you know, places like uh, Mongolia and stuff like that would kind of be like prairie areas. Uh, temperate deciduous forest. If you are in a deciduous forest, what will all of the trees do in the fall? Deciduous means they lose their leaves. Okay. Coniferous means they have needles for leaves and they typically don't lose them. Okay. Uh, there are exceptions to that. Um, coniferous trees also make cones to reproduce, whereas deciduous trees are usually flowering. Okay. They usually have something like that. All right. So, obviously... Much of the eastern part of the United States and southeastern or south-central Canada would be considered to be deciduous forest. That's where you're going to see maple and stuff like that. Okay, Much of Europe was at least at one time temperate deciduous forest. That has changed significantly since the Industrial Revolution when many of the trees were found to be flammable and as a result used in the Industrial Revolution to fuel factories and build houses and things like that. So there's been a lot of deforestation uh, through Europe, but that's at least what it was at one time. Okay, the taiga. This is a big one for Canada. Coniferous forest. If you've ever been, let's say, to Fort McMurray, you are in the taiga. All right? If you go to Banff, Jasper, okay, into Kananaskis. A lot of that is taiga as well, where you can you get into the mountains and all you see is like this carpet of spruce trees, right? And basically, there's nothing else growing, just these spruce trees. That's the taiga, right? So much of Canada is taiga, okay, quite a bit of it. It's a little bit hard to see here, but the taiga kind of ends, kind of in that area, and, and you obviously see it on mountains, 
Okay, you see a lot of taiga on the mountains, and much of Russia okay, is taiga as well. Right, very very similar uh, kind of of um, plant life and animal life in Russia as there is here. Okay, and then uh, lastly is the tundra. Okay, and the tundra is where you get beyond the tree line. Okay, on mountains we can see where the tundra starts and the taiga ends. It, it is what we call the tree line. It's just you can see it on the mountains. It's just there's a spot they look kind of dark and then they're light. Okay, and that's where the tree line is. The tree line is based on temperature, not on altitude. Right. So as you go further north, the tree line is lower and lower and lower on the mountains. Okay, um, to the point where you'll get to the tree line for not being in the mountains, and that's what we call the tundra. So the tundra means treeless. It's essentially an arctic prairie. Right? You can see for miles and miles. Okay? So there's a fair amount of that in the far north of Canada and Alaska and in Siberia, the northern part of Russia, where many people ended up during the reign of the KGB and the USSR. If you screwed up, you got sent to the salt mines in Siberia. Okay. It was very cold and miserable. Everyone with me there? Okay. So those are the biomes that we're going to go over. All right. So we'll start with the tropical rainforest. Shay, I'll have you just turn off that front side so you can see the pictures better. Please and thank you. Okay. Um, what do you see a lot of in the tropical rainforest? Really, really big trees. Okay. In fact, in this picture, you're not even seeing a quarter of those trees. Because all you're seeing in this picture is what we call the canopy the upper layer of the tropical rainforest. The tropical rainforest is so dense with plant life that it's actually got layers to it. Right? There's the canopy and like a subcanopy, and then there's you know three or four more layers below that. Okay? Well, if you're walking on the forest floor of the rainforest, you would probably not be able to tell whether it was a sunny day or a cloudy day. Because the light is so blocked by all of the big trees growing around you that it would be hard to tell. It wouldn't be dark. Okay, but it would certainly be hard to tell where the sun was, which is also why it's easy to get lost in the tropical rainforest. Okay? If, you know, we, we don't realize just how much subconsciously we use the sun to tell what direction we're going. Okay? You know, if it's in the morning and we look out that way, we know that that way is east, because okay? the sun is coming up over there. Right? So we, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to uh, find your way unless you're very familiar with the area. All right, so some characteristics here. First off, tropical rainforests cover 13% of the Earth's land surface. That might be a smaller number now. There is a lot of deforestation, okay, um, especially in the Amazon, uh, for a few reasons. Some of it is, is economic development. Um, they, they did a lot of deforestation for the World Cup there last year. Um, you know, like they built a stadium out in the middle of nowhere that you actually had to take a boat to get to. Whatever. Okay, but they had to clear some forest for that. Um, they they also you know they have a growing population, so there's you know some deforestation for that. But there's also a lot of deforestation that has to do with people just trying to grow enough food to live. Okay, uh, Brazil and and a lot of the countries uh, in in South America are, are the people are poor. Okay, and and they live day to day on whatever they can eke out of the environment. Um, so they engage in what's called slash and burn agriculture. They cut the forest down and set it on fire. Okay, and, uh, and then they try and grow food in the ash uh, and soil that is left behind. Um, the problem with that is, is that'll work for a season, maybe two if they're lucky. Um, but tropical rainforest soil is really nutrient poor. Okay, believe it or not. I mean, you got all of these trees and all of these plants growing there, but the soil is crap. Okay, um, and the reason for that is, is that there isn't very much of it. It's mostly clay because it's always flooded and the floodwaters are always washing the soil, the topsoil away. And so it doesn't stay there and being covered by water all the time leads to something called leaching. Right? And leaching is exactly like it sounds. It's sucking the nutrients out of the soil. Right? So if you've got water sitting on top of dirt, the dirt gets saturated and all the minerals that are in the dirt dissolve into the water and move by diffusion it from high concentration in the soil to the low concentration area of the water and then they get carried away. Okay? So the soil is really, really poor for agriculture. 
Um, plus, you have the problem of getting flooded and having your crop washed away. Um, so, so it's a it's kind of a big issue. There's a lot of deforestation that goes on because they can't grow in the same area really more than one or two years before they got to go and cut down another spot, okay, in order to farm there. So it's it's really difficult. Okay, um, so we got things like um, high temperatures because we're near the equator. Okay, high rainfall. Now that means looking at a climatogram that we're going to have an even temperature line pretty much all the way across unchanging and same for our rainfall it is going to be high and steady right i mean they call they they call like june july august their dry season okay but it's not really dry okay it's still really wet compared to here okay um if you look at the rainfall here okay their driest month is 150 millimeters of rain Okay, that's about that much, and that's a dry month. Okay, but it is—it's steady as well. Okay, their wettest month is you know 220. Well, that's not really a whole lot of difference, but it's steady all year long. So you're always getting lots and lots of rain there, and that's how you get forest that looks like this. Okay, these mountains are steep, maybe even steeper than ours, but they got plants on every single square inch of them. Okay, and we just don't see that here. Right? I mean. How would you get a plant to grow on a sheer cliff like that? I mean, look at this rock spire right here. Okay, it's covered in plants. It looks like a chia pet. Okay, like it, they just grow everywhere, and it's because there's constant rainfall. Right, so much rainfall that plants can literally grow anywhere. Right, and it is incredibly thick. Okay, it's not like a forest here where you know if you flew over top you could see to the ground. Right, search and rescue in the rainforest is like practically impossible. Right? Whereas search and rescue in Canada, well, you fly over the spruce trees and you can see all the way to the ground. Okay? So it's a lot different. It's very, very thick. Okay, soils, kind of covered that already. Soils associated with these forests are characterized by intense weathering. Okay, that means they, they get washed away really easy. And uh, loss of minerals by leaching. Decomposition is incredibly rapid. So if something dies and falls down, it, it's gone in a matter of probably weeks, maybe days. Right. Uh, part of that, it never gets cold to slow the process of decomposition. And there's tons and tons of bugs. Okay. If you don't like bugs, do not take a holiday to the tropical rainforest. You will have a miserable time. Okay. We don't know what bugs are like up here. We have little tiny bugs. Okay. They're nothing compared to the bugs in a tropical area. There's lots more of them. They're lots bigger. Okay. And they obviously can help decompose dead materials a lot faster than okay, uh, fungus and moss and, and, and the small bugs that we have can do it up here. All right. um, intense weathering caused by high rainfall causes near total removal of all soluble nutrients. And that's, again, why that slash and burn agriculture doesn't work very well. Okay. They're often low in calcium and potassium because those tend to be very soluble. And since they're covered in water a lot of the time, they dissolve easily. Okay. And so when you can see the soil and there's nothing kind of, no big trees and stuff growing on it, it's very red. Okay. It's very red in color, and that's because of the loss of certain minerals and the, the leaving behind of other ones. Okay. And you can see there's lots and lots of roots. Okay. That soil is very, very clay-like. It's not like our soil here that's kind of loose and, and black. Okay. Okay, so it's soil profile in the rainforest. Okay. The A horizon, or top soil, is very, very thin. The B horizon, that's mostly clay, basically comprises all of the soil. And way, way down, you would find the parent material or the rock okay, that that soil came from. All right, vegetation in the tropical rainforest. Okay, tropical rainforests have extremely diverse vegetation, okay, both in species composition and structure. Okay, there's often up to eight different layers of vegetation. Okay, so you got you know your undergrowth, understory, okay, uh, so, you know higher understory, uh, lower subcanopy, higher subcanopy, and upper canopy, lower canopy. Like you've got there's just tons and tons of layers there. All right, um, the big thing is not just the sheer number of different kinds of plants and trees, but also the diversity. If you go into a forest in Canada, like let's say you go to Banff, okay, and when you get to Banff, you see Engelmann spruce, um, white spruce, black spruce, um, lodgepole pine, and that, that's about it. There's four or five different kinds of trees, okay? The, the vegetation isn't very diverse, okay? 
in the tropical rainforest, there could be up to a hundred different types of trees in one hectare. In Canada, there'd be four or five. In the tropical rainforest, up to a hundred. Now, to give you an idea of how big a hectare is, a hectare is a hundred meters by a hundred meters. It's roughly the area enclosed by our running track. Okay, that's about one hectare. In a Canadian forest, there could be a hundred trees, but not a hundred different kinds of trees. Okay, in the tropical rainforest, there would be thousands of trees made from hundreds of different species. Okay, it's crazy the diversity and difference. Okay, give you some idea. I mean, looking at this picture here, okay, you can see that there's lots of different kinds of plants in there. There's all different shapes of leaves and things like that, and that's how thick it is. It it's difficult to walk through if you don't have a machete. That's one of those big knives that you swing in front of you when you walk through the jungle. Okay, uh, That's a good idea to have. Because uh, you can not only clear your way, but find your way back. Because this just closes in behind you like a set of drapes. And you, it's really hard to see where you've been. Okay, my, my dad and I decided we would do a little hike here. This is in Hawaii. We would just hike into the rainforest, which was incredibly dumb. Because we had no compass or map or anything. You know, we just kind of walked in there. And, uh, yeah, we were lucky that at one point we got close enough to the road to hear it and follow the sound of the road to walk back out to the road, okay, and then follow the road back to our car five kilometers away. Okay. So, it, yeah, you you got to be careful. It's so different than forests here are. Okay. And I think I showed you this picture before, okay, where we had uh, the plants that have the special roots for anchoring them and then the roots for breathing when they're flooded, okay, so they can continue to get oxygen. Lots of special adaptations for plants there. All right, tropical rainforest animals. You know, you would think with all of these trees and all of these plants and things like that that you'd have lots of big animals, but you don't. There's very few large animals in the, in the rainforest. There are, however, lots and lots of bugs, lots of amphibians, lots of reptiles, and lots of rodents. Okay, so smaller mammals, but very few big ones, uh, because it's hard for big animals to move around. It's also flooded a lot of the time, and big animals have to be on the ground. So you tend to get smaller animals that are what we call arboreal. Okay, arboreal means that they live in the trees. Okay. Um, so yeah, bugs. Okay, you got things like the praying mantis, okay, um, walking sticks. Has anyone ever seen one of these? They're really cool. Okay, um, they're kind of big, but they're really cool. Um, a TA, a TA I had in university, he was an entomologist. Every week he would bring in a different bug to our zoology lab, and uh, he had a walking stick, and I let it just like clamp onto my arm, and it had a couple of its legs on my fingers and a couple of legs kind of on my arm here, and when you would blow on it, it would sway like a branch. Okay, like it would if it was in the jungle, you'd never see this thing. It perfectly camouflaged, okay, into the into the jungle. Uh, and then you got big things like uh, scarab and dung beetles. Okay, um, their name is just exactly what it sounds like. They eat dung. Okay? They roll it up in a big ball. In fact, play with it. Okay, um, but yeah, they're, they're, the bugs are really really big, which means there's lots of really long food chains in the jungle as well because you got this bug that eats that bug and the bug that eats the bug that ate the bug and so on and so on until you get like the bird that eats that bug or whatever so the food chains can be very very long okay we got uh, lots of like we said amphibians because they um, require a lot of water and a lot of moisture okay uh, we've got small mammals like this little cute guy okay. and then this would be like one of the larger mammals anyone know what this is yeah, it's a three-toed sloth. All right, it is the slowest land mammal, and it lives entirely in the trees. It's got toenails. You can kind of see it right here. Okay, they got like claws that are like a coat hanger, and they just flip them over the branch and hang out, literally. Okay, and yeah, they're very very slow, but they don't have to be fast because they don't really have a lot of predators. They're kind of the biggest thing, and they hang out in the trees, so whatever came after them would have to be in the trees. So they, they do pretty well, even though they're really slow. Uh, and they just kind of you know chew on leaves and stuff like that. And it, if you've ever seen their face, though, they've got a weird face. Eyes are really close together. Kind of weird mouth. Yeah, they look odd. Okay. Um, but yeah, you wouldn't if one of these was on the ground, it, it wouldn't do very well, because their, their musculature is not designed to bear their weight above their arms. It's designed to bear their weight hanging below their arms. Uh, that's why they're so slow. If you put them on the ground, they, they basically just crawl. 
and, and they're incredibly slow. In the trees, they're not really fast, but they're quite a bit faster because they can just kind of shimmy hand over hand um, on the trees. All right, the big problem with animals in the rainforest is that a lot of them are endemic, which means they only live in one very small place, and that may be the only place in the world where that species exists. So deforestation in the rainforest is probably the leading cause of species extinction in the world. And a lot of times we don't even know we've done it. Okay, we just cut down that, you know, log that one area and that was the only area this particular little tree, flo tree frog lived. Okay, and we didn't even know it. All right, so it's, it's uh, really, they got to do a lot of studies on areas to make sure there isn't anything endemic in that area before they, they log it. All right, chemical cycling. So how fast does something get recycled in the rainforest? And the answer is really, really fast. Okay, when a tree falls in the rainforest, it makes a sound, and then in a couple of weeks, it's gone. Right? Just because there's lots of moisture, there's lots of decomposing organisms, it's warm, okay? there's lots of fungus and, and, uh, and things like that. So a, a tree that falls in the forest is going to be gone in a matter of weeks. Whereas here, a tree falls in the forest and it's years before the thing completely decomposes. All right? You could step on the same rotting log you know, probably 15 years in a row. Because right? the decomposition process here gets interrupted every year. It only really gets to go for about five months, and then it gets interrupted for six or eight months or whatever. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Savannah. So the savannah is like the tropical rainforest in terms of temperature, unlike the tropical rainforest in terms of rainfall. Not in terms of amount of rainfall, just in terms of distribution. Okay. A savanna will get about the same or possibly even more rain in a year than a tropical rainforest will, but it gets it all in like three or four months, and then it's dry as a bone okay, for the rest of the year. Right? So they have what's called a monsoon season, and then they have their dry season. Okay? That's why you don't see complex forests growing in this area. You see large tracts of kind of tropical grassland. Okay, so 12% of the Earth's surface, okay, and most of it is in Africa. Okay, there's a little bit in South America. Okay, typically it is a grassland biome, but there is some open woodland here and there. I mean, you see kind of little places where there's patches of trees or maybe even groups of trees going up a mountainside okay, or something like that. Okay, so the climate, okay, is really responsible for the way that this biome is, is shaped. Okay, and that is what we talked about there just a minute ago, the monsoon season. Okay, months with fairly high rainfall, and then virtually nothing okay, for, for several months after that. Okay, so you get things going really well, you get lots of grass growth and things like that, and then everything kind of just dries out, ripens, and, and uh, you know, there's, lots of, there's lots of food around. Okay? There's lots of food for, for herbivores, uh, for large herbivores, but um, again, it's, you, know, you get this long, long dry season. And that leads to lots of wildfires. Wildfires are very prevalent in the uh, savanna. And that also keeps big forests from really getting going as well. Okay, um, So plants in this biome, they have to estivate. That means go dormant. Are plants in the tropical rainforest going to go dormant? Never, right? Because they're constantly getting the ideal growing conditions all the time. OK. Um, what's this thing that the cheetah is sitting on there? It's not just a hill. It's a termite mound. Okay, There's lots of bugs in the savanna as well, but termites are one of the biggest ones. And that's because, for much of the year, you've got dry, dormant plants. And they love to chew on dry plant material. Okay? We don't ever worry about termites in Canada because it's too cold here. The winter kills them off. Um, but in tropical areas, a lot of their building codes are related to keeping termites from eating the wood the house is made out of. Right? You don't want to get termites, especially big tropical ones, starting to go in your house because they will literally turn your house to a pile of sawdust. Okay? Uh, and that's what that is. That termite mound is basically a big hill made out of termite poop, which is basically sawdust Okay, because all they do is eat wood and other plant materials and they chew it right down to nothing. 
Okay, so yeah, they can really take down large tracts of plant material in a hurry. They eat lots of seeds and things like that, so plants have to make tons and tons of seeds just in order for a few of them to germinate because the, the termites are everywhere. All right, so vegetation, lots of the trees in the savanna are fire resistant, the ones that are there, because fires happen so often. Okay, um, things like uh, eucalyptus and stuff like that, they can be burned right down to the to the bark and they'll come back. Okay? They're fire resistant, they have the ability to do that. Um, so they have to, the plants there have to be resistant to water loss, be able to survive long periods of drought, okay? uh, have deep roots and they have flattened crowns. Okay? So what I mean by that is, uh, let's show you a picture here of flattened crowns. Okay? So we got a lot of the trees have this shape. You can see they're very flat on the top. Okay? They're almost umbrella shaped. Okay. The advantage of that is they shade their roots. Look at the shade down here. All the animals are chilling in the shade here. Okay. It, it shades their roots, and that limits the amount of evaporation from the soil that their roots are in. Right. So it's a, it's a good strategy for them uh, to do that. Right. Now, uh, other things, African elephant grass. Okay. It's called elephant grass because elephants can hide in it. It's like bamboo. It's thick, okay, and it can grow to heights of three to four meters tall. Okay, uh, we had a guy who uh, he moved back. He was from South Africa. He moved back, uh, I think, first semester of this year, um, and he was telling me that this. He said, "Yeah, that's no joke. That stuff grows around our house, and sometimes it grows like up to the roof." So it's it's crazy tall. This elephant grass, and uh, and obviously there's a lot of food energy in that if you're a herbivore. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's lots and lots of different kinds of plants, just not lots and lots of different kinds of trees okay, in, in a tropical uh, grassland like the savanna. Okay, in the savanna, soils are thick. Okay, there's lots of topsoil because grasses build topsoil very, very well. Every year, the grass that grew there dies and new grass grows up from underneath. So there's always a layer of, of humus, okay, decomposing material that always gets put back down. Okay, and so that can le lead to very, very thick kinds of soils. Okay, for the uh, savanna, for the uh, fauna, that's the animals. Okay, uh, obviously, we have lots of big animals in the savanna. Right? So almost the opposite of the tropical rainforest because there's lots of wide open areas which tends to lead to the development of bigger animals. And there's lots of grass to eat, also leading to bigger herbivores. If you have bigger herbivores though, you have to have bigger carnivores. So food chains are really short in the savanna. Grass, wildebeest, lion. Done. Okay, not like hundreds of bugs all through the food chain. It's just, okay, herbivores get preyed on directly by the top carnivores, okay, lions and tigers. Uh, and then you'll also have your scavengers, okay, so you'll have like hyenas, okay, and things like that, vultures that will um, circle a kill and wait for the animals that killed it to be done with it, and then they'll come down and pick the bones. All right, so there are a lot of those as well. Okay, uh, we also mentioned uh, about the termites. Okay, the termites are great for decomposing the plant material. Okay, so if, you know, when plants die, they'll come in and eat it all up, and then they leave these big mounds that are full of nutrient rich soil building material. Okay. okay, chemical cycling again is pretty rapid. The dry part of the year will slow it down a little bit from what a tropical rainforest would do, but again, you've got high temperatures and you've got lots of organisms that help the decomposition process, like termites and things like that. Okay, so things can cycle pretty quickly. There are some issues with um, with weathering and erosion in the trop in the savanna, because during the monsoon season there can be a lot of flooding. Okay, and that can wash away soil in places. And there can also be um, rain splash type of erosion. So the soil is really, really dry, and then a wicked storm comes in, and the drops are so big that when they strike the soil, they pop up a whole bunch of dust okay, before the soil gets wet enough for that to stop, and the wind can carry a lot of that stuff away. All right, in the desert, okay, like we said, there's different kinds of deserts. This is a rocky desert. Right, like you would see in Arizona or Nevada or Utah, okay, places like that. And then there's the sandy deserts, cold deserts, and hot deserts. Okay, um, so we're going to deal with them kind of in general here. They cover a third of the Earth's land surface, which is bad because you can't really do anything 
in the desert. Okay, you can't grow anything there. They're not productive. There's not a lot of animals. Okay, things like that. And unfortunately, a lot of the Earth's land surface is covered with that. Okay, big thing for a desert temperature is rel is usually fairly high unless you've got a higher latitude desert, and then you'll get more of a bell curve. But what they all have in common is this. Okay, low low, low precipitation. There are months where no rain falls at all. Okay, And their wettest month gets 50 millimeters of rain. So that's what, 5 centimeters. So yeah, about that much. That would be their wettest month. Okay, And they get that for like 2 months and then it's dry again for the other 10. Okay, so uh, it's definitely going to lead to dry conditions. That doesn't mean that there's no life there. There are plants in the desert. They're very highly adapted to the desert, but they're there. Okay? They do have to protect themselves. That's part of their adaptation. They don't want animals uh, coming in and trying to get moisture from them or food from them, so a lot of them have developed defense mechanisms like thorns and, and other nasty things okay, that they might have. Okay, so again, these are pictures of North American type deserts, okay, rockier deserts, and you can see that there is vegetation there. But it doesn't cover every square inch of the soil. Okay? There are lots of places in the soil that are just open. Okay? Um, so we got saguaro cactus. Okay? Saguaro cactus are kind of the thing we always picture when we picture a desert. We either picture shifting dunes or we picture that. Okay? Um, anyone know how old a cactus has to be before it grows an arm? 80 to 100 years old before it grows its first arm. Okay. After that, it'll grow an arm about every 10 or 15 years. Okay. So if you see a cactus with lots and lots of arms, that is a very old plant. Okay. So they grow for a very, very long time. Okay, and you got other really scrubby, okay, very um, xerophytic. Okay, that's the drought-loving um, types of, of plants in there. Okay. Okay, soils, well, they're not very good. For one reason, they're always dry and they're easily eroded by wind. So you don't get a lot of stuff building up in terms of topsoil. The other reason you don't get a lot of topsoil, there's nothing there to build it up. There are no plants that are dying and leaving behind, you know, lots of humus and remains and things like that because they get desiccated and dry after they die and they blow away, right? So it's very tough to build a soil under dry conditions. So you can see there's practically no A horizon. There's a really thick B horizon and the parent material is like, pulverized. Okay? It, there's not big rocks, there's smaller gravelly types of things. Yay. Animals in the desert have to be adapted to deal with the heat and the dry. Okay? Uh, one of the ways to deal with the heat is to be nocturnal and only come out at night. So lots of animals in the desert are nocturnal. Okay? Uh, animals that do come out in the day typically don't stay in the sun. They'll stay in the shade and kind of you know, jet out and get whatever they need uh, when they need it. Um, you don't see a lot of big mammals in the desert because it's too difficult for a big mammal to survive. There isn't enough water. The exceptions to that would be like maybe an antelope. Right? An antelope can survive in pretty dry conditions. In fact, they may never drink water. Right? They can eat cactus. And uh, as a result, they can get enough moisture from that. They have a very efficient kidney. Okay. Um, and they also have a mouth that's like shoe leather. If you've ever uh, seen a dead, dead antelope, okay. the inside of their mouth is literally like the leather of your shoe. Okay. So they can clamp down on a cactus and the thorns just break off. They don't stick okay, in, their, in their mouth <laughs> tissue, and so they can just do that. Okay. Uh, another thing that uh, some animals can do is uh, they can use what we call countercurrent exchange. Okay. That means that their blood flows in a certain fashion in order to uh, help them cool their blood. So this, um, you can actually see the blood vessels in this picture in the ear of this rabbit. Um, and so what happens is you've got these small capillaries that are near the surface of the ear, and then the rabbit will go into the shade and it'll kind of flop its ears a little bit to cool the, uh, the, the blood that's in the ears and then that cooler blood goes back into the body and they feel cooler. Right? You don't want to be an animal that sweats in the desert because that will kill you. Okay? You'll just get dehydrated in a hurry and not be able to rehydrate afterwards. So all the animals there have to cool themselves using other means. Okay? There are a lot of bugs in the desert as well. Scorpions and, and things like that that have a really hard carapace that will prevent evaporation. Um, 
and you're going to find lots of reptiles, okay? Specialized reptiles with sealed, scaly skin uh, that, again, don't sweat and don't lose a lot of water. Okay, chemical cycles. So this would be more of a hot equatorial type desert, this picture. Uh, chemical cycles are really slow if they move at all because most chemical cycles require water. Okay, so these, these don't move very fast. Okay, temperate grasslands. So now we're talking about the prairie, something a little bit closer to home. This is prairie. This is cactus, okay, and rock. Um, does this look like prairie in your mind? When we say prairie, we always picture like, you know, fields of grain and, you know, big grassy areas and stuff. But that's long grass prairie. This is short grass prairie. So if you go down to Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, and places like that, this is what you see. Because this was taken about 40 minutes north of Medicine Hat near Empress. Okay? And it's short grass prairie there. There's lots of cactus. There's, the grasses are short and scrubby. Okay? It's as close to a desert as a grassland can be. Okay? Um, does that mean that it's not productive? No, it's very productive. Hey, if you time your, your seeding right, these can be very productive agricultural areas. Or if you have access to irrigation water, they can also be very productive. And down south, they do have access to irrigation water. Okay, up in our area, okay, we get a little bit more rain, so the grasses that grow here naturally tend to be a bit longer, and we can grow different crops without irrigation. Okay, so they cover about 7% of the Earth's total land surface, but represent the most important agricultural zones in the world. Right? Obviously, most of Central North America is the grain belt. Okay, that's usually what it's referred to. That's where we produce a lot of the grain okay, um, for not just ourselves, but for the world in general. All right, so grasslands experience significant soil moisture deficit due to the long period of drought in late summer and autumn. Obviously, early summer is our wettest time. Okay, June is our wettest month in general, July 2nd. Okay, uh, May would be probably be third, but August tends to be quite a bit drier. September pretty dry, even October. Okay, before the snow flies, it tends to be pretty dry. All right, so here's what we see: climatogram for Calgary, Alberta. We can see that the curve of both temperature and precipitation follow each other. All right, wettest month June. Okay, and we tend to get uh, you know around 85 uh, millimeters. I think that's an eight, 85 millimeters of rain in June. Okay, and our other kind of wet months are in the high 50s. Okay, and then it it gets drier after that. And you can see that obviously our temperature fluctuates a great deal as well because we're very far inland and we're quite far from the equator. Okay, so we definitely have uh, a winter and a summer. Okay, so we're looking at average temperature per month. Okay, being about minus six to minus 10 in our coldest months and you know 16 or so 17 or so in our warmest months okay so the two types of prairie short grass prairie here on the left okay so this is by medicine hat long grass prairie this is like by st paul so it's a little bit northwest of edmonton Okay, so we see very different types of, of stuff growing here, and these are taken one week apart. Right, so about the same time of year. This, this prairie is absolutely burnt in August when I took this picture. Okay, but up in St. Paul, where we still have prairie, but you also see some trees here and there, okay, we obviously have much longer, greener grasses because different types of things grow there due to increased rainfall. Okay, so mixed grass prairie, that would be this, okay, dominated by wheat grass, fescue, okay, and things like that, whereas short grass prairie is rough fescue, peri oak grass, okay, spear grass, okay, uh, things like that, so much more drought tolerant things. Okay, did you sign in? Okay, uh, grasslands have really thick topsoil for the same reason the savanna had really thick topsoil. If grass is growing there, every year you've got a mat of um, thatch, essentially is what it's called, which is dead grass blades and things like that from the previous year. And that's very nutrient dense. When it starts to decompose, it builds up nice nutrient rich soil. Okay, fauna. See all the animals in this picture? Yeah, you don't. Because the animals that are supposed to be on the prairie are gone. And that's entirely our fault. Okay, the animals that used to live on the prairie have been hunted to ex to near extinction or 
what we call extirpated, which means forced off of their native area. Okay? The prairies used to have tons and tons of animals. There would be grizzly bears and black bears. Okay? There would be wolves. And most importantly, a really big thing. Buffalo. Those are gone. Okay? The buffalo got hunted nearly to extinction because we brought rifles over from Europe. Okay? Now, before that, hunting buffalo was far more difficult. Okay? When you, if you came to, the, to Canada in, let's say, like the 1500s, 1600s, okay, uh, before there was a lot of European influence here, the way you hunted buffalo was you scooted them and skirted them and frightened them into running with their heads down, and then you ran them off a cliff. Okay, how many of you have been to head smashed in buffalo jump? Okay, that's that's how the native people used to hunt buffalo. Okay, they wouldn't kill the whole herd. Okay, they'd just run a few of the really dumb ones off a cliff. Okay, the dumb ones taste just as good as the smart ones. Right, so they'd run them off a cliff, and and then they would go down there and and uh, and harvest the ones that had run off. Okay. And uh, and make no mistake, they were very, very good at making use of every single part of the buffalo. There was very little waste. Okay. Um, I was actually fortunate enough, I had some native friends when I was in high school, and I watched them one time actually gut something that they had hunted. And I tell you, I'd never seen, like, there was a use for everything. Right. And I was like, man, aren't you just going to throw that away? That's like the intestines. No, 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 we can... You can use that for a sausage lining, or you know, they just they used it all. Okay, it was it was unbelievable. There's just no waste. Okay, whereas you know, when the Europeans came, it's like, well, I want the big steak, I want the big roast, that's fatty, that's guts, and I don't want it. Okay, they just didn't eat a lot of it. Okay, so um, there were problems with that. Uh, the invention and use of the barbed wire fence was also a problem. Okay, because it disrupted the migration patterns of many of our herbivorous native animals. Um, not that they couldn't run through, like a buffalo could run, they could run through a barbed wire fence like it wasn't there, wouldn't even leave a mark. But they're not that bright. So they come up to a fence and just stop and then walk along the fence, not cross it, not run through it, eat all the food in that area, and starve. Okay, they were migratory animals. They were used to just having free reign of the whole prairie, okay, and they would migrate hundreds of kilometers throughout the year and they would literally mow the province right down like someone had a big giant ride on lawnmower okay they would eat the grass right down to the ground and then migrate and then it would grow back up they'd turn around and start coming back okay and eat it right back down again so obviously disrupting migration patterns was a big deal for the buffalo and once the buffalo were gone the big carnivores had to move on because there just wasn't enough of the smaller herbivores to sustain them. Okay? So that pretty much moved the grizzly bear off of the prairie. Okay? Now we only find them really in the mountains. Um, deer, antelope, okay? we don't see as many of those anymore either, um, simply because they compete with our farm animals for the same resources, grass. Okay? So we typically don't have as many of them around either. Um, Okay, so we've put in instead cattle and sheep because they're a lot easier to manage. Okay, you you uh, you know tick off a cow and you probably wouldn't even know it because they're pretty mellow. Okay, you get a buffalo angry and you're in big trouble. Right, because yeah, they're they can be very aggressive when they're angry. So they haven't been something that people have tried to domesticate because it's nearly impossible to domesticate them. Cows are a lot easier. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the big thing there is that essentially now we're down on the prairie to the native type of rodents, gophers, prairie dogs, okay, uh, ground squirrels, uh, and then, you know, coyotes and foxes are still doing okay. Not great though, okay. We, we obviously killed off a lot of the, uh, the big carnivores because they ate the animals we were trying to keep around, okay. You didn't let wolves hang around because they'd kill your cattle and sheep. Um, generally, we shoot coyotes as well because they're you know, eating chickens and, and things like that. So, okay. Yeah, really changed that. Okay, chemical cycles are slow because of winter, but still effective. Okay, things will decompose and return their nutrients to the area fairly effectively on the prairie, but the longer the winter is, the slower that's going to be. Um, unfortunately, that process is too slow for us to effectively perform agriculture without the input of fertilizer. 
Okay, so we do generally put fertilizer on most of our agricultural fields just because the natural cycling isn't quite quick enough, uh, especially if we have a nutrient um, needy type of uh, crop like, let's say, canola okay, or something like that. Okay, temperate, deciduous, broadleaf, evergreen, and sclerophyllous forest biomes. I'm, I'm combining the deciduous and the chaparral into the same thing here. Okay, just because they have a lot of similarities. So the trees are all ones that will lose their leaves. Okay, so we'll have um, all of those types of, of trees. We'll get into the list here in a minute. 9% of the world's land surface. The soil here is quite good. So a lot of times you will see these getting cut down for sometimes for lumber. Um, although they're mostly for pulp and paper because the, the wood of a deciduous tree is soft compared to the hardwoods uh, that we probably prefer for building things. Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, the soil in these areas is quite rich because every year, what ends up on the, on the ground? Leaves, okay? And leaves represent lots and lots of nutrients that can be decomposed and recycled. So the soil is very loose and very rich. Okay. Uh, so they're in more warmer or temperate areas. Now you might not think of like Toronto and Montreal as like temperate areas, but they're temperate compared to where we are. Okay, the winter is not never quite as severe, and the summers are a lot hotter uh, and a lot more humid. And you can see here that rainfall is higher and steadier than it is on the prairie. On the prairie, we had a definite rainfall peak and a definite rainfall low, but in the uh, temperate deciduous forest, rainfall is a lot more steady, and that's how you get big trees as opposed to grassland. Um, we do still, however, have a curve for the temperature, okay? Because this is a temperate area; it's above 30 degrees latitude. There's definite seasonality, okay? So we've got you know temperatures dropping down around freezing in the winter time, okay? But staying quite high, up to 26, okay, in uh, in the summertime. Okay, so like we said, hotter summers than we have and not as cold the winters as we have. That's why it's more temperate. Okay, so the big thing for temperate deciduous forest, guys, if you're talking climatogram, okay, is steady rainfall with a bell curve temperature. Right? That's how you can tell if it's a deciduous forest, is steady rainfall with a bell curve temperature. Right? If you've got steady rainfall and a flat temperature, then you're looking at probably a tropical rainforest instead. Okay, so vegetation, we've got, again, the deciduous plants. Oak, beech, hickory, okay, uh, birch, hazel, sycamore. Obviously, up in Canada, lots of different species of maple, okay, things like that. Um, if we're talking about uh, sclerophyllous forests, like we would have in the Mediterranean, then you're going to have olive, uh, sessile oak, and pine, okay, so uh, kind of tougher trees like that. Um, but you don't you do see the layers in a temperate deciduous forest but not like you did in the tropical rainforest there might be like three layers like under undergrowth understory and canopy right whereas in the tropical rainforest there could have been up to eight layers right? um, the trees can live quite a long time but again they're different kinds of trees okay soils like we said they're going to have a pretty rich a horizon because every year you get all that leaf litter okay building up in there um, you will tend to see a few more uh, in terms of uh, animals. You'll see uh, some bigger herbivores and some bigger carnivores. So you'll have lynx, although those are pretty rare because people like them to make coats out of. Okay. Um, you'll see some wolves, uh, and you'll see weasels and foxes and things that are uh, subterranean. Okay, that means that they live underground. Right, the soil's pretty loose. It's pretty easy to dig through. Okay, uh, so they can make good tunnels and stuff like that. Okay, and we do see some of the bigger herbivores like moose and elk. Okay, so there's going to be lots of those uh, going on as well. And, of course, lots of bugs too. Okay, that kind of soil with all the leaf litter uh, holds moisture underneath and is a perfect place for bugs to lay eggs okay, and, and hatch from and, and have lots of places to go. Okay, and chemical cycling is reasonably rapid because it's more temperate, so the, temp the winter is not as long. Um, there's more moisture, and that's always important for getting chemicals to cycle and, and things to decompose. Okay, so it's definitely quicker uh, than it would be kind of in our area. Okay, for the uh, Tega, um, 
that's one that again that we're familiar with here in Alberta because it covers a fair amount of Alberta. Uh, Nine percent of the Earth's land surface, and it's relatively undisturbed because most of it is in pretty remote and hard to access places. Okay, how many people have been to Fort McMurray? Okay, how many people have been like right out to the to the uh, mines? Okay, like some of the roads that go out to those mines are hairy. Okay, and and so they are in in places that are not easily accessed but we're making them easier to access because there's lots of valuable resources okay like the oil sands and things like that out in those places so these this biome is becoming more harvested than it used to be okay it used to just be this was a source of lumber so you'd have some clear cutting and, and things like that but now it's being found that there are large usually deposits of of uh, oil sands underneath uh, and so there's going to be a lot more development of that resource as well now, the big problem with these areas is that they tend to get a little bit of rain through like June, and then after that it gets really dry. The only source of moisture really is the runoff from the snow. And usually when that runoff is coming, the soil is still frozen, so it doesn't penetrate and it doesn't absorb. So forest fires are a pretty big issue in places like the Tega. Now, that doesn't mean that forest fires are bad. Forest fires are important. Okay. If we if we uh, don't allow forest fires to happen, then the nutrients don't get cycled, and that's one of the best ways for nutrients to get cycled in this uh, biome because it's often very very cold, and so nutrients don't cycle quickly that way, All right? But they do cycle if you set them on fire, okay? And then the ash settles to the ground; they can decompose more quickly. It's also the only way you get new growth, All right? Is is to have the old growth burn down. Right. Then, then the seeds will open because a lot of those trees have pine cones that will not open unless they're exposed to high heat. Okay. They're covered in a resin that seals them tight and they can sit on the ground for years. And then when the, the rest of the stuff burns down, they pop open the seeds release and they germinate and then they slowly grow from there. Okay. I think we talked about that when we talked about periodic disturbances before, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's an important part of this. All right, so the climatogram, definitely a very sharp bell curve located very low on the graph. This is a cold biome. Some of the coldest temperatures on Earth are actually, re are actually recorded here rather than in places that are cold all the time. Okay? This has got the wildly fluctuating temperatures. So you can see winter months, the temperature is minus 25 to minus 30, and in the warmest months, it might get up to 15 Okay, as an average daytime high. And we can see that... Moisture is, you know, at a peak in, in the summertime, but it's never very high. Wettest month is like 50 degrees Celsius. The only reason that plants like these can grow there is because it's cold, and so it doesn't get ridiculously dry because of evaporation. Okay, if it was hotter there, okay, then obviously there'd be a lot different growth. And again, when you look at the Tega, you see this carpet of trees. All right, other big problems for the Tega, or characteristics, not so much problems, is permafrost. Okay, that means that the soil is frozen for 8 to 10 months of the year, which means a very short growing season uh, for the plants that grow there. So a lot of those trees are very old because they don't grow very much each year. Okay, and vegetation, not very diverse. We've got you know, a few species of, of spruce trees, maybe a couple species of pine trees, some grasses, and kind of scrubby brush that grows in the undergrowth, and that's it. Okay, so not a lot of diversity in terms of the types of uh, plants that live there, which also in turn means there's not a lot of diversity in the types of animals that live there. Okay, so we'll have larger herbivores, larger carnivores, and not a lot of the smaller stuff. Okay. Now, uh, for the animals, they have to be adapted to the winter. The winter is long and harsh. So they have a couple of options. They can stay and hibernate, or they can migrate. Okay? So there are very few animals that actually stay active throughout the winter, the exception being like moose, okay? uh, arctic hare, and the arctic fox. Those would be ones that would stay active throughout the, uh, throughout the entire year, but many of the animals will either fly south or they will go into hibernation or um, something like that. So um, if you've got like these little voles, they use the insulative properties of snow to survive. We talked about the Quincy the other day and how snow is a good insulator because it's reflective uh, and it's got air pockets in it that prevent conduction and convection. So these little guys here have got these burrows in the snow where the temperature is above freezing, even though outside it might be minus 40. 
Okay, so they're pretty well insulated in there. Their biggest problem is snowmobiles, because when a snowmobile comes along, it pushes the it pushes the snow down and compacts it. And when that happens, those air spaces that it was using for insulation are gone. So this snow here is high density and useless in terms of eva in terms of insulation. Okay, so once you drive over it in a snowmobile, okay, if there was a animal's little tunnel underneath that, he'll never use that part of that tunnel again because no, there's no insulation in there. Okay, other animals will do this. Okay, ground squirrels and, and tree squirrels and stuff like that will um, they'll eat like crazy and then they will go into this dormant state. Okay, um, one of my profs in university he did his whole study on uh, the uh, metabolism of these animals and how they could um, metabolize the fat stores that they had over the winter time. And then he developed, as a result of that, something that they, you don't see anymore. It was called the Canadian Cold Buster Bar. You know it as Power Bar. Okay? He was the guy that developed this. And it was his idea was that the ingredients in this bar would help people metabolize fat because they were the, similar to the things that these gophers and squirrels would eat that would help them to metabolize fat while they were dormant. They never really worked out that way. But. Um, so th what they do is they go into this dormant state, they slow all of their metabolism right down. Okay, if you were to pick this squirrel up, you'd think it was dead because it would be cold and stiff. Okay, their body temperature will drop to below 10 degrees Celsius. Their heart will beat once a minute. Okay, they'll breathe once every couple of minutes. Like honestly, you would think they were dead if you held them in your hand. Right. Every once in a while throughout the winter, they'll wake up and for the first like hour, all they'll do is sit there and shiver. Okay, until they get their body temperature back up so that they can move around. Then they'll go and they'll eat some of the seeds that they stored in their burrow, and then they'll go right back to sleep again. All right, so these guys are what we call the true hibernators because they lower their metabolic rate. Bears do not truly hibernate, even though we always say they do. Okay? A grizzly bear just kind of sleeps, okay? but its metabolism doesn't really slow down. Right? It doesn't really have the ability to do that. Okay. Um, Anyone know what that is? They're very rare. It's a wolverine. Okay. An unfortunate part of being in this area is that you have to have very, very thick, luxuriant fur to keep you warm, which is a problem because people like to wear things made out of thick, luxuriant fur to stay warm. And fashionable. Okay, uh, so a lot of these animals have been hunted for their fur. They are trapped for their fur, uh, and so a lot of them are endangered, like the wolverine. Okay, um, a wolverine is is about the size of a German shepherd. Okay, uh, about that size with long claws, not like the superhero, but fairly long, um, and they are violent. Okay, if you can imagine all the intensity and aggression in a grizzly bear concentrated into something the size of a German Shepherd. That's a Wolverine. Okay? You don't want to make them angry. Okay? They will rip your face off. Okay? They are very, very aggressive, very territorial. Okay? And they're great hunters because they're short and quick. Right? So they can hunt down even rodents, which actually makes them fairly adaptable. They don't have to take down huge prey because they can actually catch smaller stuff and there's larger numbers of the smaller stuff around. Okay. Uh, there's also going to be bears, grizzly bears, black bears, and things like that in these kind of areas. Okay, so you will see a lot of the bigger uh, carnivores uh, as well. Okay, um, but for a lot of them, they have a season where they eat a lot, and they have a season where they eat very little. Okay, uh, grizzly bears um, obviously are not entirely carnivorous; they're omnivorous. In fact, especially in our area, more of their diet comes from plants than it does from animals. Uh, that's why in late August you have to be especially mindful if you are in the lower elevations because that's when the grizzly bears are eating the berries, okay? And they'll eat tons of them, okay? That's why their their scat is so disgusting. And if you've ever seen what bear scat looks like, you can tell if a bear has used a tree to wipe its butt, okay? It's yeah. They, if you eat a lot of berries, it tends to be a little runny. Okay? Yeah, it's pretty disgusting. Right. But um, bears will eat tons and tons of berries. They'll just take a whole like branch full of berries, stick it on one side of their mouth, clamp down, and pull the branch through. Okay, 
and just all the strip all the berries and leaves right off and eat that. Okay, they get a lot of calories out of that because berries are full of sugar, right? Um, but you don't want to disturb them while they're doing that because they get kind of territorial during that time, and they usually have little cubs around, and you don't want to mess with them when they got cubs around. Okay. All right, uh, chemical cycling, very slow because it's cold. It's so cold, and it's cold for so much of the year. So nutrient cycling doesn't ever really get to get going. Um, so, you know, when a tree falls here, okay, it might be laying on the ground for 15 or even 20 years before it's fully decomposed okay, and, and recycled. So, again, the cold weather limits the number of decomposing organisms and the, number, the amount of time sorry, that they have uh, in order to act. Hey, hey, tundra, Arctic tundra and tundra bi alpine tundra biomes. So, no trees. That's what tundra means. Tundra means treeless. Okay, and so we don't have any large growth. And again, that's because of two things: temperature is too low, and soil is too poorly developed. In fact, in a lot of the tundra, the rocks are right at the surface, and you can actually see them in this picture, poking out. Okay, kind of in different places here, you can see just the rock, all right? And what's this? Snow. All right, and guys, the date on this is probably hard for you to read, but this is July the 6th. Okay, in the tundra, there are places in the tundra that the snow cover does not disappear. Okay, It'll, they'll stay snow covered the entire year. And as a result, the soil underneath stays frozen. That's permafrost, all right? So we got very thin poor soil that is only usable for short par short parts of the year. Now, here's the good news though for plants that live in the tundra. During those short parts of the year, how much sunlight do they get? Lots. Okay, if we're talking about Arctic tundra, they are in places where the sun is above them for 24 hours a day for several weeks. Right? And so they have, yes, a short time in which to grow, but they get lots of sunlight in order to do it. All right. Um, an issue for uh, plants that live in the arc or the alpine tundra, that's the stuff above the tree line, okay, is uh, exposure to ultraviolet radiation. The higher up you go, the greater the chances are of getting a sunburn, okay, because you have less atmosphere between you and the sun to protect you, and plants can get a sunburn too. All right. So the tundra is characterized by intensely cold conditions and the development of permafrost, okay, only for a brief period. During the summer, does it get above freezing and allow growth to occur? Okay, look at your uh, climatogram here. Okay, our wettest month, okay, is 60 millimeters of rain. So this climatogram, because of scale, makes it look like it's really wet, but 60 millimeters of rain is that much rain. Okay, that's 60 millimeters. It's not much. Okay, so 60 millimeters is a very small amount of rain. Okay, um, and it's reasonably steady, with more of it coming, okay, in late summer. Right, as opposed to early summer like we get it. And if you look at the temperature line, the warmest month is below 10 degrees and the coldest month is below minus 25. Right, so that bell curve is very steep and very low. Okay, vegetation, again, tundra means treeless. So when you're above the tree line in the mountains, this is, this is alpine tundra as opposed to arctic tundra. Okay, you see that snow is present well into July. This was taken on the 7th of July. Okay, so there's lots of snow banks still around. Okay, by August, a lot of that snow will still be there. Okay, um, but it does serve as good protection from the plant for the plants during the winter from the icy winds. Oh, sweet, finished. Okay, um, so remember what you're going to be asked about for biomes. Here's a bi here's a climatogram. Tell me which biome it's from. Okay, so make sure you look over that and uh, and then multiple choice questions, picture and description okay, of the biomes. Uh, remember also that stuff we talked about yesterday, okay, the uh, latent heat problem. There's going to be one of those for sure. Specific heat capacity problem, make sure you can solve those. Okay, those will be something you probably want to look at tomorrow and over the weekend when you're reviewing.